If you're just coming in now, uh, you're in the right spot for this week's Future Trends Forum. We'll begin in about five or six minutes. So for those of you who are just coming recently, like Doyle, like Jeff, Dan, and another Jeff, and on, welcome. Glad to see you. Michelle. Hello, Rita Marie. Hello, John. Again, if you're just joining us, take a minute to uh, introduce yourself in the chat box, like Dan and Mr. Hunt and Fred. And uh, if you haven't used Shindy before, look around a bit, look at the tools. I'll show you how it works in just a few minutes. Let's say hi to the other people here from the Future Transform community. There's some great folks. They're going to want you to move off the camera. What? They're going to want you to move away from the camera in a minute, so I'm just going to move this. Yeah. If you're just joining us now, uh, this is the place for this week's Future Trends Forum. And we'll begin our conversation in about two and a half minutes. So take a minute right now while you're settling in to introduce yourself in the chat box. If you haven't done that before, just go to the bottom of the screen. There's a white strip of menu options running across it. On the leftmost edge, uh, you should find the button. Press that, and up will pop the chat box. So you can say hello to everybody. Just don't put anything formal, just say who you are and where you're from. And already we've had people like uh, Dana, and Tara, and Fred, and Michelle, Richard, and Jeff all saying hi. And to my welcome to everybody. Welcome to uh, Kathleen, Alan, Christina, hello Paul, hello Mary Jo. We'll be starting in about two minutes. We'll be starting about one minute. So, hello to Melissa, hello to Mark, hello to John. Good to see you all here.
Hello, Ian. Hello, Chang Hong. Hello, Shravan. Hey, Tracy. Gary. Good to see you all coming in. We'll be starting in just a few seconds. Well, welcome everyone. Let's begin. Welcome to this week's Future Trends Forum. I'm your host, creator, and cat herder of the forum, Brian Alexander. Very glad to see and hopefully hear all of you today. Uh, it's a great day to be here because we have a lot going on. We have a splendid guest and a whole bunch of conversations and questions I'm sure we're going to have. But before we begin, let's introduce the forum. Let's talk about where it came from, who supports it, and how it works. And then we'll get started with this week's guest. So to begin with, please know that the Future Trends Forum is a discussion-based event. This is where we have conversations about the future of education. And this spins out of, here, Tara, let's go to the next slide. This spins out of a monthly publication, a trends analysis called the Future Trends in Technology and Education Report. If you haven't seen this, it's a monthly trends analysis. It takes a look at how 86 major trends that are reshaping education and technology. Uh, it's a print publication, it's a PDF, it's free if you like. Just go to ftte.us to sign up and learn more if you like. Now, over the next slide, please. This forum, that report, and a few other projects all fall under the banner of the Future of Education Observatory. So this is a whole bunch of different projects, including a bookstore, a book club, um, a widely um, active blog that tries to probe where higher education is headed. So if you haven't seen this project, just go to Future of Education at the U.S. and you can learn more. Next slide, please. Now, the forum has been going on for about two and a half years, which is remarkable. Uh, and in June and May of this year, we started looking at where we go next, because we've accomplished a great deal in a short time. So we started exploring what we call phase two of the forum and what that can mean. So we did a lot of conversation, we had polls, we had several meetings, and a whole bunch of great ideas came from all of you, and we've been implementing a lot of them. So just to remind you very quickly, one is we had a lot of great suggestions from great guests, and we've been inviting them. In fact, we are scheduling now through January of 2019, which is great. Pretty soon we'll release a website that has a list of all the upcoming guests. We've also had interest in having discussion areas for discussing ideas that happen between sessions. So we launched several of these, uh, including one on Slack, one on Facebook, and one on LinkedIn. And there's also some interest in having interest groups. And so some of these are available. So if you're interested in those, please form up and let us know. But phase two proceeds. I would love to hear more of your thoughts. Yeah. On to the next one, please. Now the forum is sponsored and made available and it exists because of the generosity of certain groups and I'd like to thank you before we proceed. But to begin with, I'd like to thank NYSERNet in New York State. That's a nonprofit organization that helps bring connectivity with that state's colleges and universities. Uh, they do terrific work. We just had a meeting, in fact, last week at Cooperstown, New York. Uh, we're very glad that they have been helping us and we're really, really glad of their sponsorship. So thank you, NYSERNet. We're also grateful to Shindig because Shindig makes it available this technology that we're using now. Let me just walk you through it if you haven't seen it for a while or if you're new to it. So one key part is where I am and where this whole slide is just for a minute is called the stage. And it's called that because everybody here can hear and see everything going on up here. Now you can join us. Our guest will be up here. In fact, there could be four people here at any given time, which is pretty exciting. Now below us where you are is what I think of as a participant area where participants swarm. If you look around, you can see a whole bunch of people. Often it's an individual link. So there's, for example, uh, Christy, uh, Walt McCormick, hello, Christy, um, looking at us and probably horrified that we're talking about her. Um, you can also see people who don't have video uh, that's that's active, like say Michael Cato or Gary Fitzgerald. Each of these little objects represents one sign, usually one person. And 
see it, they move around during the hour as people um, move, as they as more people join us. In fact, right now we have about 63 people on this video conference. So if you'd like to talk to one of those people privately, one thing you can do is simply click on them. And if they want to talk to you, your two icons will click together like Lego bricks, and you'll have your own private audio visual bubble, which is pretty good. Now, for the general conversation, there are three main ways to communicate. I want to share these with you. Look at the bottom of the screen. There's a white strip running along it, a bunch of different options. So the very left edge, you see what looks like a bunch of heads and a number, 64, and next to it, a line, a kind of box. If you click that, up will pop two different windows. Window on the left is a kind of film strip that lists every person who is here right now. So you can just mouse over them all. So if, you, if you're curious, so who is Michael Sano, you'll see Hired Community Manager. If you're interested in Annalise Lettinghouden, she's a curriculum designer. Uh, if you're over, if you're, say, under 40, but I don't know what a film strip is, but take my word for it, that's the operating room for it. You can see everybody here. Now, to the right of that, you'll see a chat box. That's a traditional chat box. You can type in something, everyone can see, and everyone can hear it, which is pretty exciting. And we find that during these conversations, this is often a way for people to have informal conversations. People have questions, people have uh, links they want to share, they might have a, uh, uh, a way of talking to people, maybe a joke. Uh, oftentimes they'll put down a citation to an article or a book. Uh, right now we just have Maria Anderson and Melissa Coulter saying hi. Again, if you haven't used the chat box, just quickly click your name in there and say hi, where are you from? Let's say a little more if you like. The chat box will be running throughout the hour, and that's a pretty reliable, easy way to communicate. So that's one. Number two, go back to the white strip. You'll see a question mark icon. If you mouse over it, the word ask will float above it. This is another way of communicating. Press that button and you get a window which lets you type in a question or a comment that you'd like to ask. So if you'd like to ask today's guest, for example, can you please define innovation? Click that, type in your question. When the time is right, we'll flash it on the screen so everyone can see it. And I'll read it out loud so everyone can hear it. Now, back on that white strip is the third one, probably the best one. There's a raised hand icon. If you click that, we can beam you up on stage, so you can join us for a conversation. So if your microphone is working, if your uh, camera is working, if your broadband is good enough, it's not too shaky, uh, and you're in a spot where you can talk, please click that and you can join us. It's really easy to do, it's easier to do than it's for me to describe, actually. Um, but those are three ways. Depending on your mood, depending on where you are, depending on your technology, click any one of those and add your questions and thoughts as we go. If that's not enough, if you're running Twitter right now, just use the hashtag FTTE, which will be tracking, and throw your questions and thoughts that way. So again, this is a conversation-based medium. That's what this is all about. What I'm doing here, telling you things, I'm going to stop this in just a minute. It's going to be about you. Now, we're very grateful to Shindig for making available the technology that lets all these conversations happen. Thank you. We're also grateful to our friends on Patreon. If you haven't seen Patreon, it's a crowdfunding site where people can agree to chip in to keep a creative project a person going. In this case, the creative project a person is the Future of Education Observatory. Let's try to explore the future of education. And you can see here from this image, we've had dozens and dozens of people contributing. Everyone from Tom Hames, Michael Slade, Michael Higgins, Jeannie Kim Han, Kyle Johnson, Karen Meister, Robin DeResa, all kinds of great people. You can chip in as little as a buck a month just to keep the lights on and the machines running. And we're grateful to them for their support you should join them. It's easy. Now, that's who supports us. That's how the technology works. That's what the forum is about. Let's dive into this week's guest. So this week's guest, we're very, very excited to have is Richard Price. Because Richard is the currently the Research Association Associate for Higher Education for the Clayton Christensen Institute. And of course, the Clayton Christensen Institute is devoted to the great work of this very, very, very important business thinker who gave us the idea of the disruptive innovation. So Richard is their point person in higher ed, and we're going to be talking to him about innovation and disruption in higher education, where he sees it going and how it works. So please, let's bring him up on stage. Let's welcome Richard and uh, see if you can resist his smile, because he has an extraordinary one. I told you. I told you he did. Greetings, hey, Richard. Point, what is this? <laughs> it's an ambush. It's a love ambush. Uh, where are you today, Richard? I'm out uh, near Palo Alto, about 10 minutes from Stanford. Nice. 
Nice, nice, very, very good. Well, welcome to the forum. Uh, I'm glad you could make time, and uh, I'm really looking forward to your conversation. Uh, I just want to begin by asking uh, a bit of background question. Uh, at present, what are you doing for the Christian Institute? What does it mean to be a research associate? Are you writing books, giving talks, hanging out in think tanks, beaming telepathic transmissions into people's minds? What's your work about right now? Um, so I joined the Institute about uh, close to a year and a half now ago. Um, I am kind of the broad end of the funnel for the higher ed team, which consists of all of two people. Um, ah. so I spend a lot of time looking at not just traditional higher education institutions, but any company or any enterprise that is focusing on creating human capital and connecting students to learning experiences, but also eventually to the next place in their career path. Um, so that includes everything from community colleges, um, four year universities, uh, coding boot camps. We even talked to like chief learning officers at large corporations and what they're doing to upskill their workforce. So it's anything after high school. Um, it can be a learning provider. It can be a company that connects students and creates platforms. It's very broad, um, but we feel like that's we'd be shortchanging the space to leave any of those um, players out. And uh, oh, I guess that's your question of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, yes. A lot of it, just keeping up on current events is already a hard thing to do um, in such a broad area. But I do um, quite a bit of writing. I run our Innovators Worth Watching blog series. So that's where I profile innovative players in any one of those categories that I mentioned. I occasionally have speaking engagements like this one or um, you know, I'll present as a keynote speaker um, in Pittsburgh in October. Um, so those, those do come up. And sometimes people will come to us. We had a few um, MBA students from France come and do a tour of Silicon Valley, and one of their stops was to listen to us talk to them about disruptive innovation, They're just across all sectors. Um, so that happens as well. And then um, the rest of the time, it's, yeah, publishing research that we, we just put out there for free for folks. We're not trying to sell anything. So, yeah. That sounds great. It's a wonderful position and a busy one. And well, let's, uh, well, thank you for that, and uh, and let's dive in. And again, friends, I, I have far too many questions. Uh, I always do, um, but this is not about me. I'll make sure that you have your chance to submit your questions. So again, remember, that's stripped the bottom of the screen, which has all those different options. So please exercise those options and let us know what you would like us to be talking about, what concerns you have, what questions. If you have examples of, uh, of anything that you'd like us to bring up, just let us know. Uh, my this is a kind of a big question, I'm afraid, is if you think about formal post-secondary education, so not boot camps, not businesses right now, but colleges, universities, where do you see the biggest disruption happening right now? What are the, or I should say, what are the big disruptors? Um, that is a, a good and rather broad question. Um, so part of what's happening right now is there's a bit of a financial crunch. Right. Um, there's been a reduction in federal aid and oftentimes in state aid as well. And so universities have to rely more and more on tuition revenue. Um, there are a number of demographic forces and a strengthening labor market that pulls people that would oftentimes fall back on a college education. They turn to the workforce now. They can actually get a job. Um, so when you don't have that government aid and you have decreasing tuition revenue for a number of different reasons, that puts a bit of a crunch on on, on, on these institutions. Um, oftentimes also you're seeing students turn towards alternative providers. And that's something that has been a new pressure recently on, on, on institutions. So I would say that right now, one of the big things that's kind of scaring a lot of institutions that we talk to is just where are we gonna get the money? As much as we are a mission driven institution, as much as we're not just about you know the business side of things, we do at the end of the day need money to run and to pay the bills and cash margins are already pretty tight in this kind of business because it is very much uh, educate each student in a high fixed cost model kind of way. Um, so they, they do have to worry about that. And we're seeing all kinds of uh, investment analyses showing that it's, it's a tough market right now. And that's right there, just right there, before even bringing out, you know, other disruptive players that are maybe taking away students from the traditional institutions, you just have a cash crunch. And that's making people sweat bullets a bit. I would ask people in the audience if, they've, uh, if they're experiencing this themselves. Um, 
you can volunteer this if you like. Uh, I think many of you are. Um, but um, this cash crunch is interesting because this is happening nominally during an economic recovery. I mean, unemployment is at very, very low levels, which is great. Uh, compensation for the average worker is slowly inching up bit by bit. Um, this should be a, a great time, or at least a decent time for higher education. But is it just the federal aid tightening up that's an issue, or is there something else driving this cash crunch? Um, I think part of it is, is as well that, well, because the labor market is so strong and people know that they can go and get, get a job. job, People, even people who say, well, before I go there, I do want to go get some post-secondary training to make sure that I'm prepared for a, for a good first job. Um, but there's been a lot of rhetoric about traditional institutions not doing a good job preparing you for that job, right? Um, whether it be because a lot of liberal institutions, liberal arts institutions have talked about, oh, we prepare you for the fifth or the sixth or the seventh job and not so much the first one, when most people are seeing that underemployment is kind of a sticky issue. If you're underemployed for your first job, it can be hard to pull out of that. And there was some recent research from Strata and Burning Glass on that very uh -huh. subject. Um, and then there are others who say, it just costs too much given what I'm going to get out of it. Um, even if you have, we, we had a, Alana Dunnigan, our head higher ed researcher, wrote a piece on, on Oberlin not too long ago, uh -huh. last year. That's an elite institution that should be kind of above the fray and should be safe from some of these disruptive pressures. But the value proposition is struggling there. Uh, after 10 years, I think their median salary was only, it wasn't even quite $3,000 above the median salary for a high school grad who goes straight into the workforce. And so, I mean, you don't want to shell out six figures to only get back an extra $3,000 a year. You know, it takes 100 years for you to reach your break even point on that. Uh, so, in addition to the cash crunch, yes, some people just don't necessarily believe that the traditional four year route is the best way to land a good first job. And that's not necessarily true. Uh, I think a lot of institutions are doing a great job of training people for the workforce, but mm -hmm. that perception is very problematic. Mm -hmm. I, I like the way you catch this. It's a question of perception of discourse, not necessarily of reality. Um, so that, this leads to definitely tightened financial times. Um, and then we have the rise of alternatives. Which, uh, which of these alternatives sound to you the most promising right now? The ones that you see most likely to have a shot at really changing um, well, I guess one productive way to look at it is what are some of the attributes that ideally these alternatives would have, you know, that would actually make them uh, grow and thrive. You can actually get some of that from looking at recent polls that Gallup has done um, with people who have already graduated from college and have been in the workforce for a long time. Um, one of the things that a lot of college alumni talk about is they had what they referred to as relationship rich and work integrated experiences during their four year experience, whether it be 10, 20, 30 years ago. They either had a professor who, uh, who mentored them. Uh, they felt like you know faculty cared about their progress and about their eventual success. Um, they had an internship experience that wasn't just that it was paid, but it was actually linked to what they were learning in the classroom. And these were some of the things that doubled their likelihood of feeling like they were thriving in the workforce and feeling like they were experiencing success. Um, so companies and alternatives and startups that can recreate some of those experiences are the ones that we think are going to truly be disruptive because it seems like there's a lack of that happening a bit in the traditional sphere right now. Um, it was, I think, only 24% of recent graduates said that they had any of those experiences during their four-year experience, um, and that makes them feel much less prepared for, for the workforce. So... When we look at something like, oh, I've been doing a lot of research recently on coding boot camps in particular. Uh -huh. Now, what are they doing well when you think of those, those things that double your chances of thriving? They are intimately connected with employers to the point where much of their curriculum is based on problem solving, uh, solving real issues that they're actually going to see in the workforce within a year, right? So there's that relevance factor that someone like a coding boot camp does well. You also have... Um, Nonprofit providers like Family Scholar House out in Kentucky, that oh, yeah. they, they provide a lot of wraparound services, and this, these you know are they only accept single mothers to live in their residences, and then they provide them with financial aid course, they provide them with childcare, um, they they help feed them, and all these students always testify after they finish the program that I really felt like they cared about me, I felt like they were invested in my well-being, and they would interface directly with college counselors to help me out. Um, so 
providers that are giving that, that emotional support, that you know, relationship rich experience, and or providing that integration to the workforce and people really feel like what they're learning is relevant, that's where I think uh, success is going to come up. And again, that's where coding boot camps do a good job. You have um, organizations like Euron uh, that are providing kind of a structured gap year um, between high school and college. They provide that kind of mentorship, that one-on-one -on -one, uh, experience, and they help students explore the world a bit in ways that feel relevant to what they'll eventually want to do in the workforce. I, it's hard to pick out specific categories because even within something like coding boot camps, there are good ones and not so good ones. Uh, but I think it's those experiences and those feelings of enrichment and relationship that characterize good alternative providers. So that's interesting. The, and thank you, by the way, for the uh, pointers to these really good examples, especially uh, Family Scholar House. Um, but when I speak to people in, you know, I'll have to get the money here then. Um, when I speak to people in traditional higher education, and when they look at coding academies, for example, they often say, well, we in traditional higher education actually do those relationships. We're really good at that. And a coding boot camp can't do that. Because, you know, they're just brutally teaching you C++ and it's not going to happen. But what you're saying is that the, the coding boot camps are actually pretty good at that by their focus on work and their intensity. And formal post-secondary education often fails at providing those relationships. Is, is that right? Do I, have I understood? Yeah, I mean, yeah that's, it's tricky to make blanket statements, right? Um, for example, I recently spoke with the CEO of one coding boot camp that offers everything strictly online. And they noticed that going fully online was fine from a curriculum and a, a knowledge delivery kind of aspect, but students were kind of craving a more person-to-person -person thing. And so they started establishing kind of meetups in a number of their cities. And through those meetups, those occasional ones, they weren't necessarily an integral part of the curriculum itself, but it gave students a chance to network with each other and network with local employers. So even among coding boot camps, there are they're finding that there's a limit to just, you know, helping students regurgitate a certain body of knowledge. Um, they do have to, or it helps a lot at least, to provide them with that kind of enriching experience. And traditional institutions are probably doing a decent job of giving students, you know, opportunities to interact with each other, and they do this. But how many of these students walk out saying, wow, you know, Professor so-and-so, that's someone I, I consider him a mentor, someone that I have a personal relationship with. Um, I had a, a kind of a privileged experience at, at Princeton where I had multiple opportunities to do that. I didn't even have to seek it out too much. Oftentimes it kind of came to me or it was encouraged by the institution. But I have a hard time imagining that I have a sibling who's at a university of 35,000 students and he often feels a little lost in the bustle. Um, sure. She is very outgoing and she is very charismatic. And so she's made, made it work sometimes. But if you're even mildly shy, you know, uh, the professor is not going to think to reach out to you in particular all the time. So it might be kind of a luck of the draw. Um, it's not in person. It's also about feeling a really close connection with someone that taught you and that could help you move forward. Um, some institutions are probably doing great with it. Others are probably struggling, and that's where you're hearing that come up in the polls through Gallup and through others. So maybe one of the maybe one response we could see down the road is the threat posed by coding academies, which leads to have traditional higher education revisit this and expand that operation. Yeah, and it honestly doesn't seem like that out of this world of a fix. Right? It might no. be kind of a the basics kind of thing, really. Um, uh, we, know how, we know how to do it. Predictive analytics and detecting with an algorithm if someone's going to drop out or not, and that's all well and good. Those are important innovations. But oftentimes there might be ways, and I don't have the solution for this right now, but ways that traditional institutions can, they like, how can we increase just person-to-person -person connections, not just having a lecture, but actually having some kind of closer mentorship bond. And alternative providers have caught on to that well. Even the ones that are strictly online, they've found ways to create one-on-one -on -one mentorship things, like a weekly check-in uh, that is serving as a decent proxy, and they're going to optimize that over time, I think. This is very interesting. Before we pursue that, before I pursue that, we have a, a video question coming up, uh, I think from Christy McCormick, I think. Uh, let's see if we can, uh, sorry, Christy Old McCormick, uh, who is a registrar. Let's see if we can get her up on the stage. Um, Hello, Christy, can you? Hi, yes, hi, you're, hi. you're a little quiet. Can you, can you get a little louder? Um, I, let's see. Can you hear me better? Nice. 
Okay. Very nice. Thank you. So Welcome. My, thank you. My question is with both um, higher ed institutions and non higher ed, higher ed institutions competing in some of the same space, based on your research, what have you, have you found employers to um, either discriminate or value the education, the credentials, the training from edu it, traditional educational institutions more or less or the same as non-education providers? And also, are they placing the same kind of value in things like badges and micro-credentials, the way that many of us are scrambling to try to create? Are they, or is that just the progressive employers? Or are you seeing that that trend is catching on? So it's a kind of a double barreled question there. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so for the first one, I think it's very industry dependent right now. Uh, I find that a lot of the alternative providers are focusing very much on highly in-demand jobs. And that's where that's why coding boot camps have come up in particular. It's not you know, literature analysis boot camps, it's coding boot camps. Everyone and their dog wants a software engineer on their team. It's not just the Googles and the Facebooks and the tech companies, but I have a friend who works at L'Oreal, you know, and they're, they're helping build a digital platform for a cosmetics provider. Um, uh -huh. Even within these tech companies, there are different tiers of expertise needed. So I live in my neighborhood. I, I'm, I bump into on the street all the time, high level software engineers with PhDs and master's degrees in computer science who are doing very sophisticated work. That's not what coding boot camps are trying to aim for, right? They're helping more with the entry level software developer position. So, so say, you know, let's look at the Google for a second. They are going to prefer someone who comes from a strong institution that came out, comes out with a good bachelor's degree or master's degree, like a Carnegie Mellon or, or a Georgia Tech. They're still going to prefer those traditional providers because they know that there's a strong theoretical foundation. It's not just that they learned how to code in the last few months. They had years of deeper training and algorithm analysis and all these things. That's the kind of training that I had with my, with my four year degree in computer science. Um, but when they're trying to fill in the lower ranks, which there are a lot more of, they're saying there's a huge shortage of software developers for this entry level stuff that doesn't require a four year degree. That's where they would probably lean a little more on someone like a coding bootcamp. So yeah. there's, to, you know, to add some nuance to it, it depends on the level of expertise and depends on the industry. I don't think right now that you have a lot of, um, you know, people who want someone with the, with an anthropology, there's no alternative provider giving that right now. So they will always rely on a traditional provider for that. Um, now, for your second question, uh, remind me again what it was. If, if the employers are placing a lot of value on things like the badges and the micro-credentials as much as degrees, or again, is that maybe industry specific? I feel like there, um, a lot of companies are waiting for someone to really take the plunge on those. Uh, right now, it's just kind of easy to say the bachelor's degree signals certain things that have been reliable enough for the, for the last several years. Um, you have a number of providers though that are saying there's been some degree inflation. Bachelor's degrees don't necessarily indicate what they used to, or they're not granular enough for us to know what skills are implied by the, by the degree. And they're providing, they're coming up with their own assessments. They're saying, you know, in the hiring process, we know what skills we're looking for, and we'll find different ways of finding of finding out if uh, applicants have those. Um, I don't know of a lot of big employers who have really fully embraced badging and alternative credentialing yet. I think there's um, there's still a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built up uh, um, beneath them first. Companies like mm -hmm. Credential Engine are trying to do that. People like Degreed are trying to find ways to quantify what those badges can mean. I think that that's coming. I think it, I, I feel like it's inevitable. Um, it just we haven't hit that wave yet. You're you're seeing a few first movers try it out. It's kind of like that S curve thing, right? Like there's a very slow trajectory at first. I can see a day in the new future where it'll, it'll spike. Uh, but for now, people are trying to do their own skills assessments, hoping that one day badges will do a good enough job that they can just trust them. Um, but yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we have a few more questions already uh, lined up, people who have been raising their hands frantically. Let's have Maria Anderson join us, a great friend of the forum, um, former guest, and a very, very active participant. Also the founder of Course Tune. Welcome, Maria. Hey, how are you? Um, so I now have two questions, <laughs> of course, because I'm waiting a little. So one of them is, I just, 
I guess it's more of a comment. I, I see kind of a disconnect between all the innovation that's pushing towards doing education cheaper, right? And and making gave, giving access to more people. And at the same time, I hear you saying things like it's mentorship, it's close connections with people, it's which is very expensive in educational realms, right? I mean, I'm pretty sure that if community colleges and 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 state institutions could afford to assign every student their own mentor, we we would, right? And so how how is the tech industry going to assign everybody their own mentor cheaply? Sure, uh, do you want me to answer that now or do you also want to yeah, ask Yeah, so I guess I get in with the question after Good question. <laughs> um, so, right, be able to assign mentors one-on-one -on -one is very expensive. The, the difference I think that we're seeing now a lot of people have written off the internet or online learning as disruptive because they saw what happened with MOOCs and said, well, clearly just putting things online is not the answer. And that's that's a fair critique. Um, what makes an alternative provider or an online provider potentially disruptive is not just putting things online, but it's, in, it's embedding it in the right kind of business model. Um, I have spoken personally with a few institutions that are either relying on creating like very live synchronous exper experiences where it's not just, you know, you put something in the chat form and someone's going to reply to you the next day, but you're actually talking face to face with someone, even if it's remote. That is much easier to scale up um, in terms of number of students, just because it's not even about the number of mentors available, but it's because there's a high fixed cost for having buildings and campuses, right? Um, uh, a physical campus for you to double your enrollment you have to build entire new lecture halls and buildings and dormitories and you have to take out 30-year loans for construction processes and that's a high fixed cost model that does not scale very well when you're online you can more easily double your enrollment and find ways to even if you have to hire more mentors you're not also paying for an additional building so part of the solution is just that online scales up much more easily with lower infrastructure costs another thing that's interesting too some of the providers I've spoken with told me, like, we don't necessarily hire full-time mentors. Um, oftentimes, there are plenty of people in the tech world, at least, in the engineering space. Uh, they love their jobs. They don't want to leave their jobs. They're very well-paid jobs often enough. But they love the idea of being able to mentor someone part-time. You know, from 6 to 9 p.m., give me five or six students, and I'll talk to each one of them once or twice a week. And I can still keep on doing what I'm doing that I love doing and also help you on the side for, you know, a much lower fee. So part of, I think, what allows tech companies to scale up as well is that they've really tried leveraging part-time mentorship. And it doesn't matter where they're in the country because they're doing it in a live synchronous um, uh, platform online. And then they try to supplement that with meetups you know, in person. But mentorship doesn't have to break the bank if you are really taking advantage of part-time mentorship models and if you are leveraging the internet in a smart way in a good business model that sometimes campuses struggle to do if that answers your question a bit yeah so we're basically going to turn all professionals into professionals that also work in the gay economy as they um, mentor people because like to bring up people in your industry you kind of have to have almost everybody in the industry mentoring students that's that's a good question i i don't really know how to answer it uh definitively i think at least with the people I've spoken with so far, the people that are in the industry and are willing to mentor, they do it gladly. I know for myself, I take opportunities to tutor every week, um, just, you know, like K-12 tutoring. It is something that find, brings me a lot of fulfillment. There's a lot of a pay-it-forward mentality in the software um, engineering industry. I don't know how well that, you know, translates to other industries. In this one in particular, for now, it's working out pretty well. So we'll see if that. I think there's like that early adoption curve, right? You, I think the people who would jump at the chance are jumping at the chance, and then you're going to hit a wall with all the people who are like, "I'm sorry, I have kids to raise, I have family to take care of, I have other things I want to do in my life." Right? Uh, it's always easy to get the first movers. But... That's a good observation. Yeah, that's something to keep an eye out for for sure. Anyways, I'll let somebody else ask a question. Like, that's a great question, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and Richard, a very, very good balance of those tensor. Tara, who's next? Who's on our next queue? I think we have a few more. We have Jeff, Jeff Ritter. Hello, Jeff. Can you hear us? Uh, sorry, what's the next change? 
Uh, Jeff, your connection is breaking up. I think we'll have to proceed to the next text question, uh, unless we have any more people in video. So we have one from Doyle. So I'll just read this out loud. Doyle asks, is the golden age of education over? And if so, if not, what does the next chapter look like? Great question, Doyle. Uh, I guess that depends on what you define as golden. Uh, in my mind, I think it's yet to come in a lot of ways. I mean, if, if the question is, will traditional higher education institutions, as they currently stand, live on in perpetuity? Um, I think we'll see some shifts in the marketplace, but I guess here, here's the way I think about it in terms of disruption. The way disruption has happened in a lot of other sectors is that you have startups or, or upstarts come up with innovations that incumbents and existing institutions will look at and say, eh, I'm not too worried about it. Let's keep on doing what we're doing. That's not going to bother us. Um, or sometimes you even have people who will see these innovations and say, I think there's a potential threat there for us. We should look into it. Let's set up an internal team and see, if we, see what we can find out. Um, however, typically that internal team dynamic doesn't work out. So disruption happens when incumbents either willfully ignore what's coming or they just have a very low probability of responding um, accurately or and well to it. And those disruptive innovations, those innovations that lead to this dynamic are often ones that increase access, they improve affordability, and they're often simpler and uh, perhaps less bloated compared to the original product or server. Now, when that has happened in other sectors, we've seen the incumbents just get wiped out, right? If you look at a, a recent and easy example is Blockbuster in the face of Netflix. I just saw, I think it was two weeks ago that we're down to one Blockbuster left somewhere in Oregon because the other two in Alaska got shut down. Now, we see that happen in other sectors, sometimes over five years, sometimes over 20 years, and we, we don't want to see that in higher ed. We think it would be disastrous. Um, higher education is, it plays too important of a role in building human capital. It builds too, too important of a role in helping us be better, well-informed citizens. And, you know, if we were to see institutions just get wiped out like that in higher ed on, on a massive scale, we just don't like the thought of what that could mean for our country. And this happens in other countries as well. Um, so what we see right now isn't so much something that's ruining the golden age of higher education as it's kind of causing a course correction and saying, hey, here's some disruptive things happening. People want better preparation for the workforce. They want more mentorship. They want to feel like their education is a little more relevant. Our job at the Institute is to say, all right, say, all right, right here's disruptive forces. If you're not careful, you're not careful. careful. this horrible wipeout scenario. Horrible. We want to help you adapt to it so that you can keep the amazing traditions you have that have generated generations of adoring alumni. We want, to, we want to help you keep that as much as possible, but also let's shift to give people a little more of what they want, what they feel they need, and what will help our economy go forward. Uh, I think, like I said, the golden age is yet to come. I think a lot of institutions are listening and they're adapting. The ones that aren't, we're seeing some casualties. We are. Um, the, the closure rate has doubled over the past few years. But I, I think there's been enough wake-up calls that people can do something about that and they can integrate better with what employers want and with what, uh, what people want. So, no, I wouldn't say the golden age is over. I'd say we're seeing a variation on the theme that can actually be a wonderful foundation for, for what's yet to come. Thank you. That's a great answer for a terrific question, Dor. I really appreciate that. That's quite a vision of both of you, uh, and quite a vision of where higher you could go. Uh, I think Jeff Ritter was translating his video question to text, so let's see if we can bring that up. Uh, Jeff asks, do you think consolidation should happen in the higher ed industry, or should it only happen when it has to happen? Good question, Jeff. Ah, good question. Um... So like I was kind of mentioning now, at the Institute, we are observing a phenomenon. We're not we're, we're not here to sell disruption or to say that it's the solution to all problems. Disruption can be good and it can also be bad. It needs to be thoughtful disruption, I think, is maybe the ideal at the end of the day. So we're not we're not rooting for, for institutions to close down and we're not thinking that, oh, you know, once we shut down 30% of schools, then we're going to be in a happy place. Um, I think if the institutions that are having to shutter their windows and doors are ones that are not de delivering on their value proposition, then maybe at the end of the day, there are worse things. Um, if there are schools that are generating high debt burdens and then are not actually giving the kind of training that people need to be self-sustaining, well, 
I mean, at least in the business world, if you're not doing a good job, then no one's going to buy your product. And if that's the reason that some institutions are closing is because people are recognizing that there's a faulty product and they don't want it anymore. Uh, it's not so much of why there should, it's just, it's going to happen. Um, I, one of the, I think, charming and important aspects of higher ed in this country, that we have this wide variety of institutions, both large public schools yeah. that service entire states. We also have those smaller institutions that serve three to 500 students in a local community in what would otherwise be an education desert, right? Um, I, I'd love to see those guys stick around, but they will have to change their business model if they want to. Um, so it's not a matter of should they consolidate or should they merge or close. It's if they want to stick around, they need to alter their business model. And we're here to help them do that um, through, we think good theory can help them do that. In the meantime, there will be other institutions that scale up and can serve tens of thousands. WGU, I think, just scaled up to 100,000 students enrolled. There will be others that do that. and. They will, they will take some students away from these smaller institutions. Um, but I don't think that means that they have to close, that they have to consolidate, um, nor, nor should they necessarily, unless they're doing a bad job, long story short. There's a slate piece a few years ago, which concluded with, let the death cycle whirl, um, you know, referring to college and universities that did a bad job. Um, thank you for that really balanced answer to Jeff's very, very good, very probing question. Uh, speaking of the questions, Tara, I think we had another question here, maybe a little text. Uh, this is a, a follow-up from, or another question from Jeff. Uh, I find innovation based mostly taking place when it has to happen. Emergency, there were alternatives, there were a way to accomplish a goal. Have you studied cases like that? Um, I'm not sure I understand. Have I studied cases, I guess, where... Is the question, are there cases where innovation does not arise from necessity? Is that, is that ultimately the question? Yeah, I, I, think, I think I'd say that, you know, when, when, when people actually manage to get, a, you know, get ahead of that curve, get ahead of disruption before it disrupts them badly. Um, so let me think about that one for a second, actually. So okay. definitely, there, 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 there are two large, two broad categories of innovation that we look at. Some are called sustaining innovations, ones that are about improving a product, you know, either patching a, a bug in the software or adding a nicer camera to the iPhone or whatever. Those sustaining innovations are ones that, yes, often arise out of pure necessity. Our customers want better. We can improve our profit margins if we, if we improve it. In higher education, it can be we are adding a lazy river because we think that will draw higher paying students. Those sustaining ones often do arise out of necessity, and it's a matter of survival and keeping up with competition. Um, now, disruptive innovations aren't necessarily like that all the time. Uh, for example, uh, if you look back at the, in, the invention of like the handheld radio, people were pretty happy with their nice mini fridge sized radios at home with their big transistor tubes, and there was decent quality, and they could hear the radio and certain songs and cowboy programs. Um, someone came up with a brilliant idea of like, what if instead of having these big hulking things, we come up with a simpler product that the quality won't be as good. It's going to be kind of crackly and staticky, but we think teenagers are going to dig it. You know, they can take it out and listen to rock and roll away from their parents and they don't need right. it to be super high quality. It needs to be portable, it needs to be durable, and it needs to be good yeah. enough. Um, that wasn't necessarily an, an, an innovation that needed to happen. Uh, there was certainly an opportunity, a good business opportunity, and I'm sure some people were clamoring for it. Or a lot of teenagers probably didn't even know they wanted it until it was available. Um, and yet, it's one that took off and forced incumbent companies to adapt. So I don't think innovation has to arise out of necessity. Um, now, putting that in a higher ed context, if you as an incumbent institution are waiting until you know that you need it, that's probably really too late. Um, the best way to disrupt yourself or to make yourself more durable against disruption is to, ahead of time, set up, we always talk about setting up autonomous units, independent sections that can innovate um, in a disruptive manner, uh, which is kind of what Central University did with College for America. They had a 3,000 student uh, no, campus university, and they said, we recognize that competency-based education targeted towards adult learners is going to be huge. It's important. Our economy needs it. And these adult learners, there are tens of millions of them. They want this. 
So they set up, without it becoming a matter of a crisis, a separate autonomous institution called College for America that started innovating around that. So it wasn't that they needed to survive as their traditional campus, but they saw an opportunity to kind of get ahead of the curve um, before it was too late. And now Southern New Hampshire has exploded as one of the largest uh, online university providers uh, in the market. It's them and WGU and maybe like ASU. Um, yeah. That wasn't a matter of necessity being mother of invention. It was, let's serve non-consumers. Let's find people who don't have access to our education. Let's see what we can do for them and innovate with uh, competency-based education and online learning. Let's, let's see if we can get ahead of the curve on that. And it's really paid off in a big way for them. That's a, Jeff, I'm really glad you got those questions in. Um, and I appreciate your resilience in uh, getting past the video challenge. We have another video question coming right up, which is from Jeannie Kim Hong. And let's see if we can be where on stage. Jeannie, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Finally made it to one of your sessions. <laughs> I'm so glad you did. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. So um, actually, the conversation is exactly along the lines of what I wanted to sort of comment and sort of question on. Um, I am wondering how equipped, um, from your perspective, are higher ed institutions to be able to employ things like design be able to create innovative solutions um, ahead of the game, but also testing them out so that we're not doing you know, horrible things to our students in the process. Because um, one of the things based on my research has been that institutions, higher ed institutions are cultural entities, right? And so they continue to stamp out what we have been uh, versus what we need to become. And that's a really big tension, especially since the higher ed institutions often are um, focused in terms of the systemic order of things on how faculty want to teach their classes or when they want to teach their classes or when, you know, those kinds of pieces versus what is it that we actually need for the future for the generations that are actually graduating. So there's a real tension there systemically and organizationally. So one, do you see any examples? Um, you mentioned New Hampshire, um, Southern New Hampshire University, but are there other examples where people have really employed um, things like design sprints? within the regular operational uh, systems within an institution to be able to get at some of those innovative solutions in a timely manner. Sure, and also I'd love to connect with you offline later to talk about that. It sounds like you've done some research on this that would also help us a lot. So I'd love to connect about that afterwards. Um, sounds good. So you bring up a very important tension that exists in higher ed and in all sectors. Um, whenever you have an institution that survived for a long time, it's found kind of a sweet spot for many, many years. It gets really good at doing one thing and that simultaneously weakens it towards doing new things, right? Um, some, there's been a lot of research uh, lately that I've seen go online, I didn't participate in directly, but about the rise of the chief innovation officer and of creating kind of chief innovation offices to, to address these matters. One university that seems to be doing a pretty good job with it is um, Georgetown. Um, with their, they, I think they call it the Red House. They have like an off-campus uh, design sprint innovation kind of unit. Um, there was a good podcast about that recently that uh, Michael Horn and Jeff Salingo did on Future U, and they interviewed, uh, I don't remember his name, who runs the Red House. Um, the, I guess the important takeaway about why what they're doing seems to be working pretty well is that it's very divorced from the campus. Um, if you try to embed into an existing culture this new idea, it's probably not going to make it. Uh, you don't have you won't have really strong advocates for it because everyone's busy doing their own thing, and it's just not what people have done in the past. If you can create an we refer to as an autonomous business unit or an autonomous unit if you don't want to use the term business, um, that's where you give them their own budget, you give them their own priorities. Say we're not going to tell you what success looks like. You're going to figure that out because we don't know right now. And you are going to have, you know, your team the way you need to do it outside of the department paradigm, outside of the way faculty is currently set up. It's your job to figure it out. And we're not going to get in the way. Um, that kind of autonomy is, I think, what allows these innovative units within universities to really thrive. If you try to fit it within your existing structure, I, I just don't know of any example where that has worked. Um, 
Another example of an institution that does a really good job is Arizona State University, ASU, over with Michael Crow. Um, yeah, they have the gold very star. Robust, yeah, that's the exactly gold star example. Um, yeah. And I, when I, what I like about being able to talk about both Georgetown and ASU, it's you know you have one that's kind of this hoity-toity elite prestigious university, but you also have someone that's really just trying to reach tens of thousands. Like to them, the sky's the limit on enrollment, and they want to bring in all kinds of students. So right. it doesn't work for just one kind of school. It works across the spectrum, but that autonomy is, I think, the defining characteristic of what makes it successful. Thank you. Question, Thank you so much. And uh, you were looking for the name is Randy Bass. Ah, oh, yes, Randy Bass. That's right. Thank that's you. Right. Um, hopefully, I'll be teaching with him in a couple of months. Um, we have uh, more questions, but friends, we're coming close to the end of the hour. It's nine minutes before the end. Um, so let's bring up uh, our next video question, if we've got one. Um, and this should be uh, Kelvin, Kelvin Bentley. Hello, Kelvin. Hey, how's everyone doing? How are you? Um, I'll try to ask my question quickly. Um, I have so many questions, and uh, it's been great to be a part of uh, today's uh, session. So I'm just wondering, though, um, you know, at the University of West Florida, where I currently work, we do have that off-site um, innovation center uh, that, that you referenced. So that's helped us a bit to, to experiment. But I just wonder what's coming for higher ed, uh, like bigger changes that would actually get more schools to embrace innovation. Um, I'm just wondering if you think we're going to start seeing states, um, you know, kind of maybe bundling in with their performance metrics, uh, kind of encouraging schools to actually innovate, to either maintain in part current state funding or to be eligible for additional funding. Um, so I'm just wondering if you see that. And if you see schools um, doing more to change their tenure and promotion policies, which I think is also a part of the challenge, because without um, acknowledgement for innovation, um, you know, without faculty being able to actually get credit for that, it makes it very difficult for the faculty to embrace, you know, innovative pedagogical models or you know, trying out new instructional technologies. So, just would love to hear your thoughts around those two things. Bye. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Um, I can tell you in an ideal world what I think uh, would be important in terms of the metrics that are measured. Uh, so far, I feel like the competitive dynamic of the last who knows how long has been around inputs and about and around prestige. Uh, when people are trying to kind of game the ranking systems and work their way up the US News and World Report, they're focused on things right. like being extra selective and having certain faculty to student ratios that make them look extra good. It's, you know, they're focusing so much on the inputs. It's the equivalent of saying like, yeah, buy all the right ingredients, but it doesn't mean you know how to make a cake. Um, I think the outputs focus is what's going to be sort of the disruptive shift that states and the federal government are both starting to recognize more and more. Um, it was happening under the Obama administration, and I think that continues to, to evolve under the Trump administration. Uh, people are recognizing that we need to shift to an outwards or to an outputs focus and outputs based incentive system. I don't think we've found what exactly those right outputs are yet. I think we were trying like ROI, we're trying things like critical learning assessments. I don't know that we found. The, the sweet spot on what the perfect output to measure is to align incentives to. But I think as far as your your independent innovation lab is, is concerned, you want to make sure that they're very focused on innovating around outputs. Um, and maybe you have to try, try different ones uh, until we kind of coalesce around the best set of outputs that we define as success. Um, as for your second question, I will be honest, we are we don't have a lot of bandwidth just between myself and the researcher. Um, so one of our kind of blind spots is in kind of internal politics and tenure and promotion. We don't have a lot of insight into how exactly that works all the time. Um, that's something that I'd love to talk to you about as well, Kelvin, offline. Uh, so we have those tensions a little bit. Uh, we just haven't had a lot of time to research the internal politics very much and what the best way are to align incentives. So that's one where you'll have to teach me a bit. Great question, Kelvin, and, uh, and, and thank you for the response, Richard. And Kelvin, please stay cool. I bet it's getting pretty warm down there. Uh, but speaking of running out of time, uh, we are very, very close to the end, and we have a bunch of questions, text questions, from 
brilliant, brilliant people. Richard, would you mind if we kind of like did a blitzkrieg through these questions really fast? I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to speak. Like a lightning rapid fire thing? Let's try it. Exactly. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, okay, so Tara, what's the next question we have? So it's from Kisa Johnson. Excellent. Will higher education be relevant in the next 10 years due to the enormous cost burdens? I know there's new cost models being created, such as Georgia Tech's computer science program for $10,000. Uh, great question, Kisa. We love Kisa here. Uh, answer is yes, absolutely. I mean, whatever disruption happens, I don't think we're going to see like any kind of massive thing happening over the next five to 10 years necessarily. Um, but even if there were, no one is trying to get rid of training and learning. Um, we just need to kind of refocus it. So I definitely see opportunities for things like the open loop university idea where people are kind of lifetime subscribers to an institution and they kind of go in and out of the workforce into education and upskilling and retraining. No, uh, educa higher education is not going anywhere. It'll look differently in, in 10 years, but it's not. It's always going to be relevant. It's the best way we have of helping people live self-sustaining and enriching lives. So reform, not revolution. Good. Next question. Let's see if we can do this. It's from Taylor Kendall. Hello, Taylor. How will the combination of AI affect the course correction you mentioned? Oh, great question. Um. The technologies themselves aren't inherently disruptive, I don't think. They do need to be embedded into clever business models. So AI, I think where it has the biggest potential is in helping uh, universities create pathway kinds of guidance for their students. Like we will use AI to look at what you're interested in, look at the algorithm, kind of figure out the best way for you to get there, what courses to take, at what institutions, online, in person, whatever. So that's where I feel like AI has the biggest disruptive potential. In terms of helping universities with their current business models, it's already doing a lot with predictive analytics, um, increasing retention, and even helping identify students who have dropped out who could come back. As for blockchain, um, that one I'm not well versed enough in to comment in too much length. I think if it's just about, oh, we want to put transcripts on the blockchain, that's great, but I don't think it's disruptive. Um, if that ends up becoming a sort of quality assurance mechanism around transcripts, then maybe we're talking, but that's one that I I don't want to speculate too much on without knowing enough about it. Got it. Oh, that's a marvelously elegant and compressed answer to a deep question. Thank you, Keith. Taylor and Keith are longtime fans and, and supporters of the forum. We love them both. Uh, one last lightning question, Tara, we have from Matthew Henry. Speaking of fans of the show and great people, what impact will the new rules have on short term and long term perceptions? Uh, I think this is the, uh, the, the rules that came out this week from the DeVos uh, department about um, making it harder for um, borrowers to get redress from uh, colleges that they borrow money from. Uh, that's when I, I just got off a bit of a vacation and I haven't been up to date as much on that. So I, I'm not going to comment on it. If you want to shoot me an email, I can read up on it and we can talk about it offline. I'm not going to guess here, though. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, Inside High Red has a good piece uh, this morning. Okay. Uh, but speaking of, uh, of, of time, you did great answering these lightning questions. Um, and the lightning is thundering in the distance because this is the end of the hour. Um, let me, first of all, thank you, Richard, for being such a great guest. And so many ideas, such suave and, and wonderful question, answers to our great questions. Um, let's ask, how can people keep up with you? How can they reach out to you? Um, so we do have, well, one you can find me on Twitter, um, on my email, I can also, I don't know if that was listed on the, on the promo for this event. Um, I did not answer uh, your, I did not post your email. Okay. I can type it down here in the chat box really quick. Um, we are very much an open book and always looking to talk to people from all sides of things. Um, our price at Christensen Institute.org. Unfortunately, it's like a tricky one to type, but you get used to it. Um, so by all means, reach out directly. If you, uh, we also have a newsletter every week that comes out with both K through 12 and higher ed blog posts um, that we post on a regular basis. Our website, uh, christensinstitute.org, is where you can see all of our research, whether it be larger publications or just smaller um, uh, posts that we write. Um, and of course, like we are always open to speaking engagements as well. Uh, we we love talking to groups about things that are scaring people a lot. The matters of disruption are kind of frightening, and hopefully we can come and soothe the waters, but also provide the kind of in the pants that people need to make the necessary changes. Um, yeah, I'd say the website's first place to go, and then shoot me an email. Love to talk. Excellent, excellent. 
Well, uh, it's been great having you. I look forward to following up uh, with another session, maybe next year. Uh, I look forward to learning from your institute and from your own work. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was a, a pleasure. My pleasure. My pleasure. And don't go, friends, because uh, we have news for next week. Um, and let me thank you all uh, for your comments and questions. Um, you can just say that um, you know, this is a big topic with a lot of bells and whistles, a lot of pieces involved. I'm really glad that we did so well. Um, next week, we're going to have a participant who I think is with us right this second. We're going to have Kelly Welch. And Kelly is the CIO for the College of Westchester, so he's got that perspective. But he's also been working very, very hard for years on blended learning. In fact, he's one of the great go-to people for looking at how blended learning actually works. So we're going to dive into that and see how the blend actually functions. We will answer the question of, will it blend? So you should definitely be here for that. Now, also coming up, we have more information. Our book club has just started its reading of Kim Stanley Robinson's New York 2140. So if you go to my blog post from Monday, you'll see dozens of comments. People have been all over this. They've been all over on Twitter. There have been a lot of arguments about it, interpretations, people taking a deep dive into the text. It's definitely getting a lot of attention. Uh, it's moving faster than New York did it, and it's really, really exciting. So please, come to my blog. Check it out and dive in. It's not just great summer reading, it's fantastic preparation for the future. And speaking of which, if you'd like to grab that book or any of the other books uh, that we've been talking about, go to the bookstore. Uh, just go to brianalexander.org bookstore and you can find the carefully curated, probably unique in the world list of books about the future of education. Um, now, other than that, if you want to stay in touch, you know we now have little communities on Facebook and on LinkedIn. You know, you can find us on Twitter just about any time, including right now. Thank you so much for being here. You guys have done a great work in building up this community. We're thinking great thoughts. We're exploring the future of education like nobody's business. Thank you so much. We'll see you online, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.